tuning into Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for libertarianism in action. We provide you with real free market solutions using the freedom umbrella of direct action to give you the tools necessary to increase your own personal liberty. As Ludwig von Mises said, liberty is always freedom from the government. And now your host, Shane. And welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for anarchism and action. We're certainly glad you've decided to join us. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the communist state of Illinois, uh, Bloomington to be exact. Liberty Under Attack is covered by a BIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse and modification by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can learn more at BIPCOT.org. First off, I'd like to thank Aaron Thompson from the Liberty Lampoon podcast for the $1 monthly contribution through Patreon. If you're unfamiliar with what he's doing over there, you can find his work at LibertyLampoon.com, a truly hilarious podcast. You can also catch my guest appearance on their show by visiting LibertyUnderAttack.com forward slash LUA Podcast 5. Again, that's LibertyUnderAttack.com forward slash LUA Podcast 5. Secondly, the full 40 plus hour direct action series is now free. All you have to do is visit LibertyUnderAttack.com forward slash freedom now, fill out the form, and you will be redirected to your destination. If you're an individual looking for non-political ways to find freedom now without asking for permission, the DAS is for you. Again, that link is libertyunderattack.com forward slash freedom now. The final announcement is the one I'm most excited about. On Tuesday, the Vonu Podcast website was launched and the, first epi- and the first episode was released. If you're a fan of LUA and appreciate the focus on solutions, you're going to love the Vonu Podcast, I guarantee it. Go check it out today at vonupodcast.com. Again, that's vonupodcast.com, and Vonu is spelled V as in victory, O, and as in Nancy, U. So what do I have for you today? Well, I've got a series that will take most of the rest of the month to get through. This past week, I recorded a four-plus-hour interview with our creative consultant, Kyle Reardon. As you can imagine, I had to do some creative work on getting this released, since the few networks we are on only run us for two hours. That said, this introductory podcast will be a little bit of a shorter one, but this is the best way I could figure out how to do this. The subject is Kyle Reardon's recently concluded extra-constitutional series on the right to travel. Now, before some of you fly off the handle and say, but rights don't exist, which I would agree with, or there is no such thing as a right to travel, please hang in there. This introductory podcast will be focused on the philosophical foundations, and we'll get into all of that. Whether you agree or disagree with Kyle is another story, but at least give him a chance to make his case. That's all I've got for the time being. I'll talk to you on the other side. Hey, Shane here. I'm joined by our creative consultant, Kyle Reardon, from The Last Bastille blog. You can find it at uh, thelastbastille.com, and Bastille is spelled with two L's, thelastbastille.com. We're going to be discussing his article series on the right to travel. So, Kyle, welcome back. It's always good to be with you, Shane. Awesome. So let's uh, get right into it. Let's not waste any time. Uh, So first off, uh, what is the right to travel? The right to travel popularly conceived is essentially the idea that you should be able to move from point A to point B within a geographical area at your own cost without being uh, infringed upon by the government or even private criminals. Okay, very good, very good. So uh, I, I've read through the entire series, and uh, I know a lot of people have, but uh, <laughs> a lot of work, a lot of writing, uh, and you know, a lot of uh, legal research and things. So, I mean, what the hell prompted you to do the series? I would say that my motivations, plural, for writing what has now become the extra constitutional series is simply that there are grievances that are expressed throughout the alternative media. Uh, I would suggest some worth more than others. But one type of grievance that is rather quite systematic and that is daily ubiquitous would be these infringements against the right to travel. Also, uh, on on a somewhat more personal note, 
of the real systematic grievances that do exist, some of which you've interviewed me about before in previous uh, episodes, actually our ver actually the very first time you had me on was about uh, my article on dragnet wiretapping, actually. So that was a real Indeed, grievance yeah. too. However, many uh, of those uh, real grievances affect me. Most of them affect me indirectly in some way. Very few of them actually affect me directly. The, what is unique about these right to travel infringements is that they have personally touched me on at least a few occasions where uh, I was in fear for my life. No joke. Yeah, no and, joke. And I had to go to, well, I, I, guess I, I guess it would be accurate to say I had to go to a courthouse, but I never saw a judge. And I guess we'll get into that in a little bit here as to what exactly happened. Um, but I've been, I've been personally infringed upon regarding the subject matter that we're going to cover. So I guess, I guess in terms of answering your question, like why do I care about this kind of thing? After my own legal situations were resolved, I, it, I, I was never satisfied with just having just survived it. I wanted to know why it had happened to me in the first place. And I also wanted to know, was I just some sort of isolated incident? Or a, ser or a couple of them? Or was this something really more systematic that affected more people? And I wanted to get to the bottom of it. And unfortunately, there is very little literature on the subject, whether in written form, audio, or, or video. And what little I could get my hands on kind of gave me clues about where to look. But long story short, Shane, I had to do original research going through government document after government document, law after law, different branches of the Texas government in order to figure out what the hell happened. And the result that I present to, to the public for their delectation is the Extra Constitutional Series. Very good, very good. And yeah, you, you, you definitely make a, a good point there uh, that, you know, there are, there are some real grievances, like you mentioned dragnet wiretapping, and that's obviously important, but everyone uses the public roads. I mean, you really can't, you really can't avoid it unless you're going to be, you know, uh, sequestered into your house, which is, you know, uh, I mean, yeah, there are some folks that do that, but uh, everyone at some point in their life uses, you know, the, the public roads, and they have to deal with uh, the infringements that we'll get to uh, here, here uh, uh, momentarily. So yeah, it, it definitely touches everybody, you know, except for, I guess, um, I, I, it touches everybody. I mean, as far as like the traffic stops, uh, yeah, maybe there's people who have been lucky enough to never have been pulled over in their life. Now, unlikely, uh, but maybe maybe there's particular facets of, you know, these infringements where people may not have been, uh, you know, uh, may not have had, you know, personal uh, experience with. But uh, uh, yeah, these, these touch everybody. You touch everybody if you're living in this uh, geographical uh, location known as the United States. I mean, yes, you focus on Texas, but, uh, you know, uh, every state requires uh, at least uh, m uh, most of these facets. Uh, so we'll, we'll definitely get more into those as we progress through uh, this discussion. So uh, if you're interested in finding this, uh, the capstone article in the series, which links to all of the other ones, uh, this is the easiest link to go to find that. Just go to libertyunderattack.com forward slash right to travel. And it's actually the number two. So libertyunderattack.com forward slash right to travel and again the number two uh so before we get into you know uh the the extra constitutionality versus constitutionality uh solutions to solutions to you know maybe you know mitigating some of these uh some of these infringements uh i think it's best to start with uh you know kind of the philosophical kind of portion of this because uh since we do mostly attract anarchists uh they're there, there have been a lot of debates, you know, on, on the subject of rights and borders and uh, and and uh, right to travel and things of that nature. So I think it's best to begin here, you know, to uh, quell those concerns first, uh, so that we can, uh, you know, get to uh, some of the some of these other things. So obviously in Ancapistan, the only borders would be those of private property. That's kind of what I that's what I want. <laughs> uh, so the right to travel seems really problematic there, and let me tell you why. I don't have the right to travel into my neighbor's house. I don't have the right to travel into your into your house. I don't have the right to, uh, you know, break into someone's business. Uh, so I guess, <laughs> could you speak to that? Because it, 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 it kind of seems like there, there could be a problem there. Of course. I've heard that same type of explanation from many different types of activists over the years. And I, I think it's fallacious, quite honestly. Uh, so yes, to answer your question, I can definitely uh, try to describe where I'm coming from, and hopefully I'll bear my burden of proof here. One way you could conceive of how the roads themselves could be arranged is that 
in arguably three different ways. So one way would be as they are today. Uh, let's just call it the statist authoritarian model. This would be the various infringements, which we'll, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, the licensing, the regulation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all the different facets that make up the majority of the extra-constitutional series. Another arrangement would be more the the hypothetically limited government or minarchist uh, arrangement, which is, I guess, it, one way of putting it would be quibbling about taxes. Uh, for anybody who understands the early American Republic, uh, there is very much a, a, of a quibbling about uh, direct taxation versus indirect taxation, and that actually is relevant to uh, right to travel. Um, and so, for example, when they would be, uh, they would argue things like a, a direct tax would be something like uh, w something that would be imposed by driver licensure or vehicle registration, uh, as opposed to an indirect tax, which apparently is fine with the minarchists would be things like taxes on gasoline or oil lubricants and so forth. So it's, it's like the one, the way they see it, their kind of odd view of property is that if it's, an, if it's a direct tax, well, that's tyrannical and awful and violation of property rights and yada, 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 they kind of sound like us, but then comes to indirect taxes, well, then, oh, then everything's mystically fine because, well, as long as you have the opportunity to avoid the tax legally, like tax avoidance, that's fine, but if it's a direct tax, well, then the only way to, to dodge the tax would be tax evasion. That's illegal, and it's also, at least statutorily, but it's also simultaneously a violation of uh, a Republican form of government. So they kind of have this odd distinction between the two. And uh, again, getting into the finer details of a Republican form of government would really be more appropriate for a different episode because that gets into very deep, deep uh, philosophical issues regarding why they're in favor of limited government. But for purposes of the roads, there actually is a connection between taxation and roads, and, and we'll get into a little bit more detail in a bit about why, about how and why that works. Yeah, yeah, and obviously, and I want to mention this too, uh, and obviously like at the, at the founding of this country, and uh, Roger Roots wrote a really good uh, white paper on this called Archops Constitutional, and like for, for the direct taxes like driver's licensure and registration and, you know, like the traffic stops, I mean, there weren't cops to actually enforce that anyways, because uh, it, it was pretty much, I think it was a sheriff, and then pretty much, you know, the citizens were, you know, the, the, the enforcers, so to speak. If they saw a violation, um, you know, they could make the citizens arrest, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. So there's these other elements, not exactly about the roads or precisely about the roads, but they're either peripheral or connected, sometimes loosely, sometimes a little bit more tightly to the road issue. So uh, I, I mentioned that in, in passing because the minarchists have their own kind of, um, I guess one way you could think of it as, uh, as being constitutional moderates, right? Well, we don't want extremes. We just want to have some degree of like public goods but we don't want public goods in everything. We just want public goods with some things, right? So we do, so the minarchist notion would be something like we don't want public goods with food production. We do want a free market with food production because we don't want to be the Soviet Union or other totalitarian regimes. But we do want public goods with some things like the schools because, remember, Thomas Jefferson was in favor of public schools, uh, albeit not quite as nasty as it is today, but it's the, the, the core that is there. Uh, public schools or public roads or public, 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 you see, you see the problem. Mm -hmm. So there, there is that. The third arrangement of how the roads could be dealt with, I think, would be that which is consistent with the, uh, the private property ethic, which, of course, is what I'm more in favor for. And I think the right to travel, as originally conceived by arguably the classical liberals, the minarchists and so forth, I personally think is consistent with the private property ethic, and let me try and carry my burden of proof here, because uh, as, as I've done before with some other things, I like to use argumentation ethics to try and, to try and you know, as a logical proof, a standard by which uh, to see if I can make sense of the world around me. So if you have somebody who, uh, let, you've got two people arguing, so one's arguing for right to travel, the other person's arguing against right to travel. Well, here's kind of a problem right off the bat. The person arguing against right to travel, what is that even implying? I mean, think about it. If you have somebody who comes up to you and says, hey, you don't have a right to travel, I don't know about you, Shane, but to me, that would kind of imply that I don't have self-ownership. 
Because if I can't move, again, if I cannot move from point A to point B at my own cost, uh, and presumably it's not trespassing, because I know that's also kind of implicit in your uh, original question about, you know, what about, you don't have the right to travel to my neighbor's house, I think was how you put it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so presuming trespassing is not an issue, then, yeah, uh, the, the assumption against, uh, if someone is arguing against right to travel, would essentially be, well, you're a prisoner. I mean, think about runaway slaves, for example. Now, those runaway slaves didn't, uh, well, their slave owners very much did not recognize their right to travel, right? Because being a runaway slave was a crime at the time, according to the state, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. So the, the, the run, even the term, the pejorative term, runaway slave, all those slaves were doing was disagreeing with their slave masters and by extension the government that they were slaves in the first place and all those people were doing were exercising their right to travel by escaping. And sometimes they would make it and sometimes they would be captured. Remember, there was a market at the time for uh, uh, bounties for runaway slaves and, and sometimes those bounties were successful and sometimes they weren't. All I'm saying is anybody arguing against the uh, right to travel, I think might actually be on the favor of, in the favor of people who essentially would be uh, justifying capturing runaway slaves. And I don't say that lightly. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and honestly, I know I've talked to you about this before and yeah, it is semantics, but uh, I'm not I'm not a big fan of the, the big fan of the term rights because uh, I mean, historically, I mean, that's kind of been, you know, a governmental type thing. Uh, so I, I guess I, I prefer the term freedom of movement. Uh, now, do you think that's that's appropriate? Uh, do you, th you think it's pretty much the exact same thing? Uh, what do you think? I think there's I think they're more or less synonyms um, again regarding semantics. Perhaps freedom of movement is more accurate. Uh, at least in some ways. Um, and it's also quite possible that maybe I've taken a liken to the minarchist term of, of right to travel. So maybe maybe there is a semantic issue, at least to some degree. Um, me personally, look, if people are denied their ability legally or, or just outright forcibly, even if it's just like a mugger or, or like a private criminal, right? Criminal element uh, from moving. And it's like, hey, you ain't from around here, are you boy? Well, there you have a criminal element infringing on your, shall we say, freedom of movement, too. doesn't necessarily always have to be government all the time. So, yeah, so to answer your question that, yeah, I, I do see it as, as basically being virtually identical. I mean, maybe the minarchists would have their own semantic quibblings about, uh, and I think we'll get that to in, in a bit here, where they view, well, you have a right to travel on the public roads. And that, I think they're, that's kind of getting a little bit problematic because, again, that's getting back to the direct taxation versus the indirect taxation issue yeah. too. So I, I would I would agree with you that when the minarchists say you have a right to travel on the public roads, I get irksome about that because now we're getting into issues of so-called public property or public lands, which actually is related, um, and 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 that really gets kind of nasty altogether. I would concede to you something though. I don't want anybody to be trespassing. Okay. But when we are talking uh, philosophically, when we are talking deontologically or about like natural liberty and so forth, I do think it is important to consider and try to also answer the question, where do the rights of one man end and where do the rights of another man begin? And so I think by your original question of or, or, or observation of you don't want people traveling into other people's houses, right, which is really more about trespassing, I think was what you were getting at. Mm -hmm. I don't want trespassing to happen either. So um, I, I think that, hell, even in that other article I did a while back where I was trying to conceive of a way to have privatized border security. I mean, I'm a Texan. You know, the issue of the political border actually is an issue down here. I just personally think that it should be, you know, the focus should be on defending the Texan ranchers. And in that other article uh, from several years ago, I basically try to conceive of a way of how it could work if there was some smart entrepreneur who could work out the nuts and bolts. But speaking more as an amateur economist, a political economist, I basically try to figure I try to figure out a way and how could the ranchers' property be defended, but also enable people to actually like come here and assimilate too. And I'm trying to think again: where do the rights of one man end and the rights of another man begin? Um, I mean, maybe some people might view that as trying to have your cake and eat it too. Uh, I personally don't. I do think that people should have secure property rights where they don't have to worry about trespassers violating, you know, castle doctrine. 
uh, or trying to. But at the same time, I don't think it is just or even wise, much less you know, right or, or, or as a princi as principled stand for liberty, to basically say to people, hey, you can't come here because you're not from around here. <laughs> because there's also that, that angle too. So, I mean, maybe it is a shade of gray, may you know, maybe not. I just personally think, I think argumentation ethics does justify, uh, shall we say, freedom of movement, I think was the term, uh, the phrase you wanted to use. And yeah, I, so I, I, I was just going to just gonna jump in and say, yeah, the right to travel thing has been brought up a lot in this, this borders dispute that's been happening in anarchist circles. And one of the arguments that's kind of been posited is that uh, the reason that, uh, you know, immigrants don't have the right to travel into America is because, uh, you know, legal immigrants, uh, rather, uh, is because they aren't paying taxes and therefore they are, uh, you know, uh, they're becoming a drain on, you know, the infrastructure of the roads and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if you've heard of that argument before, uh, but uh, uh, and yeah, it is a little more kind of expanding beyond that, but it is, it is kind of related to right to travel. So what, what do you think of that argument? I think there's. I think there may be a inadvertent, or maybe it is perhaps purposeful uh, attempt to basically try to reconcile libertarianism with statism. Honestly, I mean, I understand that a lot of the patriot types are concerned about the uh, undocumented uh, trespassers uh, basically abusing the welfare state. Now, that part of it is uh, a genuine concern. However, they're they're trying to demonize and maybe even try to criminalize uh, folks who maybe not necessarily are criminals. Maybe they are trying to flee political persecution. Maybe they are starving and trying to see if they can find work anywhere, not a handout, but as, uh, as a fellow Austinite would put it, a hand up, mutual aid and such, <laughs> where it's all you know, voluntary charity, at least to some degree, right? It's just so that somebody gets their feet under them and so they can actually then start producing again and being, you know, part of the free market as, as best they can. Because let me put it, let me put it to you this way, man. It's a little hard to go on a job interview if you can't get a shower. So, yeah, yeah, you know, there, there, there is such a thing as barriers to entry. And sometimes some of those barriers are genuinely free market. And that's why there is, as part of the free market too, if you go back into like the 19th century, there were the friendly societies, uh, the voluntary charities and all that that at times would have their own terms and conditions too, but it was all contractual, it was all voluntary, nobody's rights, nobody's rights or freedoms or liberties were being violated at any time because it was all, it was all uh, everyone's free will was being respected. That is not the case today. If someone is homeless, good luck trying to, you know, uh, find work and all that. And, sorry, get to getting back more precisely, right to travel, think about the homeless too. These, these are people without secured property rights that are, uh, you know, without shelter today. And so if the cops, you know, have to come by and say, hey, buddy, get up, you know, move, you know, they, they have to get up and move. So, you know, they're, yeah. so property, Dr. Murray Rothbard's great discovery was that all human rights are property rights. When you start applying those truths, those axioms, even like we do of non-aggression and self-ownership to the real world, sometimes some of the answers will be pretty clear cut. I think with taxation, I think that's that's kind of open and shut, for instance. Uh, the Patriots like to quibble about it, but, you know, hey. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, they don't share our principles, unfortunately, even though some of them imagine they do. And that's just the long and short of it. Uh, again, another discussion for another time. But when you apply our principles to other things, sometimes the answer is maybe not necessarily a shade of gray, but it's definitely somewhat more complex. Not that there isn't necessarily a right or correct answer, but that there is an answer, but it's, but it's, uh, there's some degree of finesse involved where maybe perhaps both sides to a dispute need to have their rights respected, which is all what I'm saying. So property rights owners should not be trespassed upon, and people who are moving at their own cost from point A to point B should not be uh, subject to checkpoints, or uh, which I know many libertarians are very much against that kind of thing, like roadblocks and DWI checkpoints and things along those lines. Those are also all infringements too. Okay, that police state type stuff, and 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 so forth. And so similarly, uh, I don't think that nascently supporting these more typical, more bureaucratic infringements that we'll get to, like the driver licensure and the vehicle registration, and then acting as if that's okay. You know, it's a little hard to say that you're an advocate for human liberty, but that you support the socialist bureaucracy in imposing all of this central planning upon motorists. I'm sorry, I just don't see how that could work. And if anybody sees a flaw with my reasoning here, you know, again, 
I would say rely on argumentation ethics. And if you come up with a different answer, please let me know. My email is kyle at thelastpastille.com. I'd love to hear it. But I honestly don't think anybody's even tried it before. And my own personal conclusion from applying Hans Hobbes's Hans Hermann Hobbes's argumentation ethics to uh, uh, the right to travel or freedom of movement, uh, uh, Shane, is simply that people have the liberty or the freedom or the right, pick your favorite word, to move at their own, move from point A to point B at their own cost and not be accosted by the equivalent of highwaymen. And see, I think, I think another issue arises too, because when uh like the the art the last argument that i kind of uh that i that i kind of said that, I, that i've heard before you know uh the illegal illegal immigrants you know they're har they're harmful on the infrastructure and, and all that and they aren't paying taxes so therefore you know it's uh it, it raises the tax burden on the rest on the rest of us so to speak well what about uh, uh you know that that could be a shot at agorism too because what if someone's an agorist and they don't pay any taxes and they still use the public roads is, is this per it, is this is this to say that you know agorism like uh, agorists are uh, leeches uh as i've heard uh, one constitutionalist kind of talk about anarchists uh, i mean there's there's a lot of issues and i think it just comes down to trying to justify um a preference uh yes to to align with uh, you know anarchist principles which i have a major major issue with and i don't see it as necessarily being a sound argument yes and that very much is a problem and yes the the minarchist the constitutionalist the patriot movement does that quite a bit where they're um i think it's a Try to remember the precise philosophical term. It's, it's a type of fallacy, but I think the more technical t concept or phrase is uh, assuming the consequent. I was trying to think of the more vernacular term, but yeah, it's assuming the consequent, where you basically make an, a, you, you, there's a certain end that you want, and that is a given, which you're not supposed to do. And instead of reasoning it out from first principles, you jump to the conclusion you already want, and then you justify it ex post facto. Which, oh, by the way, which is ironic because as, because as a side note, ex post facto laws prohibited by the federal constitution that the patriots claim to want to restore mm -hmm. or whatever. So, you know, there is the letter of the law, but what I'm getting at is there is such a thing as the spirit of the law. And I know that the patriots have been accused over the years of being like crypto fascists. I don't know. We're going over this right to travel issue. As much as the patriots may mean well... I get the impression there's a lot of socialism going on, and I think uh, as we go through this, I think I can, I would like the chance to bear my burden of proof here. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, so I guess any any other points for the uh, the introduction here? I think we we've covered pretty things pretty uh, pretty sufficiently. But uh, do you have anything else uh, for this uh, this introduction? Sure, just one last thing. Even if my reasoning here regarding argumentation ethics, regarding specifically where if someone is arguing for right to travel then by the fact that there is, as an expression of self-ownership, that therefore that kind of justifies that position, or at least it's not a performative contradiction, versus the opponent of right to travel, where they are automatically denying self-ownership by implying that you are a slave who should be, maybe not necessarily incarcerated, but let's say rooted to one spot. You're captured. You can't move anywhere. Then if somebody sees, a, 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 if I made a mistake in my reasoning again, uh, you know, feel free to make your own, you know, articles and media or, or whatever else, or, or just email me privately, uh, kyle at thelastbastille.com, and please let me know where I made my mistake. Honestly, I think I very well may be the first guy down this trail. If anyone wants to correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think anybody's even tried to apply argumentation ethics to freedom of movement, at least not yet. And if nothing else, even if my conclusion is, is wrong here, I would like to at least people to start thinking about this type of stuff and work it out from first principles, because I'm trying to follow also kind of that tradition of Henry Hazlitt, where he didn't have everything all figured out to start with. And a lot of his writing, he's kind of like searching and peering and trying to find an answer. And he eventually does arrive at conclusions, but his, his writing can be loquacious at times. And so in that spirit of Hazlitt, in some ways, I'm kind of doing the same thing with right to travel. I'm trying to find an answer about what the hell happened here, and I have reached certain conclusions. I've tried to present and be open source, right, the right to travel bibliography, which people should uh, mm -hmm. you know, pop up and is part of this series, and go through the evidence. Even if you disagree with my analysis, even if you disagree with my conclusions, at least look at the original material I've been able to make available that is straight from the government. And then if you happen to come, if your reasoning happens to be different, or you arrive at different conclusions, please, I would, I want you to compete with me with a competing 
uh, explanation, a competing uh, way of looking at things that perhaps maybe not as all was. Who knows? Maybe even political crusading is possible here. I mean, you never know. Maybe I was wrong about that, too. I personally don't think so. But then again, I don't know everything. Yeah, definitely. And I will put uh, the show notes uh, or we'll put uh, the right to travel bibliography in the show notes. Uh, so uh, uh, when we get more into the, uh, you know, uh, some of these uh, these court decisions and things of that nature, you can uh, go and, uh, you know, check those uh, out for yourself, those original sources. I also toss in the argumentation ethics anthology. Uh, if you want to, uh, if this is the first time you're hearing about it, and you don't really, uh, I mean, uh, it's a pretty, it's, it's pretty easy to understand, but, uh, uh, but if you want to gain a better understanding of it and actually, you know, uh, go through the, uh, 26 years of discourse, I think it is back and forth featuring, uh, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, Rothbard, uh, Walter Block, uh, I think Bob Murphy, uh, wrote a, wrote a uh, rebuttal to it. Uh, so it's a very, very good, uh, intellectual read. Definitely recommend you check that out. And also, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'll, I'll, uh, post a link to uh, his extra constitutional number seven, where he uh, uh, kind of the the uh, capstone article, where all the other articles are linked in there. Again, that's libertyunderattack.com forward slash right to travel, and again, that's the number two, so libertyunderattack.com forward slash right to travel. And there's the introductory podcast for the series that will take up most of January. Surely plenty to ponder from that. So here's the plan for the rest of the series. On Sunday the 22nd, we will release part two, which will cover the infringements on right to travel and whether they are constitutional, unconstitutional, or extra constitutional. On Sunday the 26th, the series will conclude with solutions on how to mitigate the infringements as well as our concluding thoughts. As for the final show in January, I'll be interviewing Philip Frey from the Valiant Growth podcast on the subject of frugality, so you can keep a lookout for that as well. Next, I'd like to get your feedback. First off, either find LUA on Facebook, uh, that's facebook.com forward slash LUA Truth, or find us on Twitter at LUA Radio, and please answer these two questions. What are your favorite methods of direct action on the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action? And if you don't know where the FUDA is, libertyunderattack.com forward slash FUDA is where you can find that. So yeah, what are your favorite methods of direct action? And also, what direct action did you do this week? I'll go first. My favorite methods of direct action are Vanu, Agorism, and probably homesteading and off-grid living. As for my direct action this week, obviously my work in the alternative media, but also some freelancing and entrepreneurship as well. What about you? Let us know. Also, please consider leaving us a positive review on iTunes. It will help us develop more practitioners of direct action. Secondly, please consider financially supporting the show. You can find all of those uh, ways to do so on the sidebar of the website. That said, I'd like to make one special note regarding Patreon. The first ever Patreon exclusive is now available, and you're going to want to check it out. This is stuff you will not find on the show. Shane's Rants, Fascist Book News, and many other projects I have in mind. You can get access to all of those for as little as $1 a month, and we certainly appreciate the support. And as I mentioned in the introduction, make sure to go check out the brand new website for my second podcast, vonupodcast.com. I think that's all I have for you. Politics has never and will never set the slave free. It's time for direct action. We'll talk to you soon. LibertyUnderAttack.com